I'm Connor Rebush, and if you are interested in the finer points of face punching, you've come to the right place. This is Heavy Hands. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another episode of Heavy Hands, this time brought to you for the first time, depending on how well we do, maybe the last time, by BloodyElbow.com. That's right. We are being sponsored, folks. We have an official platform now. We're incredibly excited to be brought to you, you know, by somebody who's paying us to talk about this stuff. Because up to this point, Pat, would you describe us as just being sad people who just have nothing better to do with their time? Than, than talk about the finer points of yeah. face punching literally for free. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that I think that <laughs> describes us well. No, we're we're super stoked about the opportunity. We're happy to be bringing the show to a wider audience. Um, you know, we uh, our thanks go out to Kid Nate of uh, of Bloody Elbow for uh, for for chatting with us about this and being willing to bring us on. Um, you know, this is this is a great opportunity for us. We're stoked. So if you if you're glad about this new opportunity, you can blame. I mean, uh, thank. Kid Nate. You can thank Kid Nate Wilcox. That that meme will literally never get old. <laughs> ever. Ever. It's been going since it's been going since I started posting on Bloody Elbow many, many years ago before I ever wrote about it, and it's never gonna stop. It's never stopping. <laughs> so uh today we are bringing you the second installment of a series that we began last week. The series is called Styles Make Fights. As the name suggests, we are going to be talking to you about styles in fighting, archetypes for analysis. Uh, The four basic styles that we've basically agreed on are boxer or outfighter, boxer puncher, pressure fighter, and counter fighter. And all of these are styles that are determined by uh, sort of mental makeup more so than by any specific skill set. Really, it's the direction the fighter likes to move, how much confidence he or she has in his or her uh, hands, feet, whatever the weapons at range may be and what kind of space they like to occupy when they're fighting. And all of these things are really kind of determined by personality and uh, personality. They're, they're, they're inbuilt more than they really are trained, though you can exert some difference on, a, on the way a person's personality is expressed in a fight by training them. But today we are going to make our first foray into a specific style. We're going to be talking about outfighters and coincidence of coincidences, Pat, we've got a hell of an outfighter to base the first part of our episode around, wouldn't you say? I think we do, in the form of one Anthony Showtime Pettis. Pretty Tony P, uh, <laughs> fighting, the, uh, fighting this upcoming weekend at UFC 185 against uh, Rafael Dos Anjos um, in what should be a pretty fantastic fight. But lucky for us, Pettis is essentially the quintessential outfighter. He offers us a really uh, interesting and intriguing lens through which to view this type as a whole. Um, he, you could almost view him as the type specimen for MMA, uh, sure. simply because he has such a defined preference. And again, these styles are more about preference than anything else. Uh, he has such a defined preference for fighting on the outside, but at the same time, he has a variety of tools and an ability to fight at other ranges that allows him to consistently fight at that at that long distance that he tends to prefer. Right, and this is kind of a classic matchup that uh, Pettis finds himself in. I like the way you've improved his nickname, by the way. Pretty, pretty Tony, Tony P. Yeah, Pretty Tony Pettis is what I've been going with, but Pretty Tony P rolls off the tongue so much better. It's... Well, I mean, given his preference for uh, for gold jewelry and uh, and and just a, a real fine. Uh, predilection for shape ups from the from the barber. I think Pretty Tony P makes more sense, and I assume lip gloss. <laughs> uh, Just I, looking you know, at him, I assume he wears lip gloss. Well, to quote uh, to quote Khabib Nurmagomedov, uh, Anthony Pettis is very beautiful man, very beautiful, <laughs> very pretty. Actual things that Khabib said in an interview with MMA Junkie a couple of months ago. Oh, I am not making that up. Uh, so so take that as you will. Well, you get beat uh, up for saying stuff like that in Russia. You you do. I mean, he called it like he started off by saying, "Oh, you know, he's 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 pretty, he's pretty," and then out of nowhere was, "He's a very beautiful man." So, yeah, I mean, I'm not actually making that up. If 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 you guys don't believe me, you can look this up. It was an interview with MMA Junkie, I think, with uh, with Mike Bone, uh, who's a, a very sharp beat reporter for <laughs> MMA Junkie. Uh, the piece came out a couple months ago. Actual thing sounded Actual at first thing. like he was insulting him, and then it turns out he doesn't really want to fight Anthony Pettis. He just wants to get in the octagon to be close to him. 
It's these aren't true. takedowns. These are embraces. Yeah, they are. I, I mean, we could we could go deep with that. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, though, I don't know. I think beautiful may actually be an insult in Dagestan based on the way that they seem to prize cauliflower ear and broken noses as, yeah. as signs of masculinity. That could actually be just the whole thing is just a work from Habib. If, if there's one thing you would, uh, one word you would use to describe a tracksuit, beautiful would not be that word. No, it would not. And uh, I don't think that Abdul Manap Nurmagomedov, Habib's father, owns anything other than tracksuits. <laughs> Um, and a bear for training, of course. But uh, back to <laughs> back to back to to more appropriate. This is go- this is going to be the last show we do, sponsored by Bloody Elbow, uh, <laughs> officially. But Too um, much tracksuit this guy. <laughs> as I was saying, uh, you know, this is an interesting style matchup we have uh, that we find Pettis in because it, it's kind of with Rafael dos Anjos. We've got the as Pettis is kind of the archetypal outboxer or outfighter. So is Dos Anjos the archetypal pressure fighter. And so we get to kind of see what are probably viewed as the two opposite types against each other. So we really get to see what makes each style distinct. We're going to see what is essentially a battle. Um, how am I trying to say this, Pat? A, a battle of ranges, a battle of directions, a battle in which both guys are going to be fighting more to decide how the fight takes place uh, and where it takes place rather than, you know, choosing which weapons to use and, and, and how to strike and how to attack, how to set up their attacks. They're really going to be doing a lot of their fighting and just trying to determine where to position themselves and how to stop the other guy from changing that position and taking it away from them. Exactly so. And and it's very interesting that this card as a whole, UFC 185, is filled with matchups of fighters who fall into very defined types. They yes. are almost arch- it is a card full of almost archetypal fighters, you know, where there's very little confusion about which one of these categories they belong in. You have Matt Brown, who who to a fault, may be the purest pressure fighter I've ever seen. Yes. I mean, he just embodies all of the good things and all of the failings about that uh, of that type with no no ability to fight against type if he's not pressuring he's not doing well exactly yeah i mean so you've got matt brown archetypal pressure fighter against archetypal boxer puncher johnny hendrix who always wants to be in the pocket if he if he possibly can uh then you have uh you have another quintessential outfighter in Carla Esparza, who either wants to be all the way out or all the way in, one of the defining features of this type, against an archetypal boxer puncher in Joanna Yenjechek. Yeah, absolutely. And so I think what we're going to do today, folks, is take a look at most specifically the the headliner and uh, the main event and the co-main event of this card. We'll we'll talk a little bit about Brown and Hendricks, but since we're focusing on outfighters and we have two archetypal outfighters in these fights, we have Anthony Pettis, we have Carla Esparza, we're going to use the opportunity to to contrast them with their opponents and really try to get at the meat of what makes their style what it is. So why don't we start with Anthony Pettis? That's the one that everybody wants to hear about. He's obviously the A side of this card, um, though I do think the women's strawweight fight might be the one I'm looking forward to the most. But uh, it's yeah, it, they're, I mean they're both absolutely outstanding fights. Yes. I think we have a chance for maybe. I, I know you're you're you Connor, you're very high on on Rafael dos Anjos and his chances in this fight, but I think. Kind of by consensus, the the feeling is that Yen Jacek versus Esparza is probably a closer matchup, and that's the way the betting lines have it, too. Yeah, I would say so, although I, I honestly view both of them as being fights that probably will be won by the boxer, by the outfighter, um, but with at least being having the opportunity to to be an interesting test for that fighter. We've got somebody who pressures well in Dos Anjos and somebody who basically does everything well in uh, in Jacek. And we're going to have two out, outfighters really trying to do what outfighters do. So so firstly, let's get at what that is. For Pettis, what does an outfighter do? What You said before that you thought that Pettis was the example fighter, you know, the, the, the specimen type for an, for a, an outfighter. What is it about him that makes you say that? Well, I think it's such, that he has such a defined preference for moving on the outside and also the the circularity of his movement. I think that given a choice, Pettis will be moving in a circular fashion, uh, will be moving in a circular fashion. He wants to be out in the middle of the cage or pushing you back towards the cage. I think we see uh, I think we see that from a lot of outfighters that either they want to be out in the middle or they do or maybe they're they're not necessarily trying to do it but they do very good work with their opponent backed up to the fe- uh, backed up to either the ropes or the fence yeah. and that that fits Anthony Pettis to a T like 
one of the things he did really well in his first matchup with Benson Henderson, what is probably my favorite fight of all time, um, was he used his teep really, really well to force Henderson towards the fence and away from the middle, which allows him to occupy the open space in the middle of the cage, where what an outfighter wants is room to move and room to operate, right? Now, so right. how do you maximize that? By occupying the middle of the cage. Now against uh, Rafael dos Anjos, chances aren't necessarily high that he's going to be able to spend much time there. Exactly. So we're yeah. going to see Pettis doing what we usually associate with outfighters, which is when we see outfighters in high level matchups, they're often not in the center of the ring or the cage, whether it's boxing, MMA, kickboxing, Muay Thai or what have you. They're generally not there because if they are against a high level opponent, that opponent is trying to do what? Trying to cut off the fighting space, trying to keep them stuck against the perimeter. But then we have the entire fight taking place with the outfighter trying to get to the center of the cage of the ring. So all of his movements are either geared towards that or moving side to side to keep the, the fighter as I expect Pettis will do to Dos Anjos uh, to keep him from setting his feet and getting off his punches, constantly trying to move and turn him, turn him, forcing him to play catch up. And I think that really gets at the meat of, of what makes an outfighter an outfighter. I mentioned this on last week's episode when we were giving our overview and I, I just kind of mentioned it off the cuff, but since then I've really been exploring the idea, looking at different matchups through this lens, and I, I it seems more and more certain to me that what makes an outfighter an outfighter is their preference to always have the advantage. More than any other type of fighter, I feel that outfighters thrive when the opponent is at a weaker position than them. And so this this means at range... Uh, if they have a longer reach, they're going to stand at range all day and punch you, uh, you know, try and give you the impression that they can walk into the pocket and then hit you as you try. Uh, if it, if they have similar reach as Pettis does to Dos Anjos, then we're going to see a lot of movement of him forcing Pettis, uh, forcing Dos Anjos rather, to play catch up, to react to him, to keep a tight hold on the initiative as much as he can so that he can choose when to strike, when to intercept Dos Anjos' forward movement, and he can choose when to keep moving and when to evade and go on the defensive. And I think that is really, really what defines Pettis as a fighter, because even though he, he can counter, for example, he can counter punch, he can counter kick as well, quite well, he does these things by creating the opportunities. If we look at the way he finished Donald Cerrone, he set up that knockout, uh, that body shot kick knockout with punches to the head, and fainted and used the threat to make his own attack work. When he did the same thing to Joe Lozon, he used the threat of his left hand to make that left kick work. It's always him establishing a threat and then capitalizing on it, not what a true counterpuncher might do, which is really letting the opponent throw and then throwing back. Yeah, and I, I think you, you raised something that I really wanted to get to here about outfighters as a type. I think that outfighters, in terms of always wanting to have the advantage, that's a really, really essential point to have. Outfighters, when they have a skill advantage or when they have such a defined advantage in speed and range over their opponent, oftentimes turn into almost pure counterfighters. Be why? Because that's where they have the greatest advantage right. to do so. So against, uh, again, to come back to that, that first fight between Pettis and Benson Henderson, Henderson at that point was nowhere close to the striker he is, he is today, especially with his hands. So Henderson would kind of wade into the pocket where he wasn't terribly comfortable to begin with. He would throw something, and Pettis would just immediately come back with something sharper and harder. Um, especially this happened a lot with kicks like Henderson would throw kind of a, would throw a powerful but not terribly crafty uh, high kick or body kick and Pettis would come back with a counter inside low kick immediately Absolutely. Right? so there were long stretches of that fight where Pettis was an almost it was just doing almost nothing but countering but that was because he felt like he had such a defined advantage out in the middle of the cage, out in the middle of that space, in terms of his speed and his reach over Benson Henderson. He, he countered because it was easy for him to do so. Exactly. Whereas exactly. we've got him fighting Dos Anjos now. Do we have much expectation that he's going to counterpunch when he doesn't have to? Absolutely not. I think he's going to avoid that like the plague. Yeah. Now, the, the one thing that we should get at is that there will be times when he will be forced to counterfight. There will be times mm -hmm. when he'll be forced to exchange and trade blows in the pocket. He did that against Gilbert Melendez, another guy who tried and succeeded to, to a large part uh, in pressuring him and keeping his back to the fence. Um, so why does a, an outfighter do that? What's, what's really the cause for an outfighter to do something that 
you know, given the description we've we've given already, they wouldn't normally do. Well, it's to disincentivize their opponent from being willing to walk into that range, right? right? That a that you see a lot of the time. Uh, these outfighters can be very, very good in the pocket. They can really throw powerful, crisp counter combinations as their opponent walks forward, but that's not their preference. They don't want to have to do that if they, if they don't absolutely have to. Like, that is, that is a thing of last resort to try and get you off. But, you know, it's, but it's an absolutely essential skill because if you want to fight on the outside but you offer your opponent no reason not to walk you down and walk into the pocket, they're going to do it all day to you. So Anthony Pettis, to use this example happens to be it's not it's not what he wants to be doing but he is very good at it he throws he throws real heat into his counters so gilbert melendez every time melendez walked into walked pettis up against the fence he had to contend with three four five punch combination coming off a coming off of pettis one of those was the uppercut that eventually stung him and forced him into shooting that lazy single that led to that led to the the fight ending guillotine against donald cerrone cerrone another pretty pretty archetypal outfighter but in that fight, it was clear that Cerrone wanted to show Pettis that he could walk into that range. So Cerrone, this was you know maybe 20 or 30 seconds into the fight. I can't remember. It's been a while since I watched it. Cerrone throws a low kick. Pettis checks. And then Cerrone immediately tries to follow by walking into the pocket. And Pettis stings him with a three-punch combination. And then Cerrone, for the rest of that fight, never tried to walk into the pocket. But that's, disincenti- but that's disincentivizing him. Yes. That's uh, that just absolutely textbook. You show them early and often that they can't get away with doing that. And suddenly, you know, even subconsciously, it may not even be something that they're consciously thinking about, that suddenly they're forced to fight at your distance, at your range. The, the degree to which conscious thought is not a part of fighting, I think, would surprise a lot of fans. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Which is why everyone's always so stunned when a fighter has a fight and he says, I have no idea what happened past the first round. I don't remember any of it. I'm going to have to watch the tape to see if I did well. And everyone says, oh, he was concussed. You say, well, maybe, but also crazy adrenaline and that's just not something that lends itself to clear recollection yeah i mean adrenaline like adrenaline actively interferes with your brain's ability to form the connections that lead to short-term memory retention yeah and it's the they're the 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 chemical process in your brain that helps you that helps you form short-term memories adrenaline short circuits those neurons interesting i didn't know that yeah, that's you. This is what the kind of content to our new <laughs> listeners that you're going to get from Heavy Hands. You're going to get a little brain chemistry every now and again. Brought to you by BloodyElbow.com. dot <laughs> um, I think what you said before about about disincentivizing that's really the key. And I the reason I I wanted to highlight that is because I really want to in each of these episodes of this series in every Styles makes fights installment. I want to hammer home the point that these styles, these archetypes are the product of temperament, of personality, of confidence, of of personal traits that are built into a person by the time they become old enough to fight. You know, unless they're they're altered by training very, very young. But really, the person you are determines the fighter you will be more so than who trains you and why they train you to do that, which is why a lot of the best coaches, their job will be not only to. Uh, you know, their job will be not only to to cr- create the best technician that they can, the best strategic application of fighting that they can, but to create the best person that they can. Because the more you can correct someone's insecurities or hide them, the more complete a fighter you can make them. And that's really what – when an outfighter, somebody who tends to feel insecure in the pocket and unconfident in their ability to exchange – that's what exchanging is for them. It's an attempt to hide that insecurity. It is fighting deliberately against type in order to send the opponent a false impression, whether that is consciously collected or not, as we said before. It's to send a message. And the example of Pettis versus Cerrone is a great example because that message was received loud and clear. Obviously, Cerrone tried it. It didn't work. It broke Cerrone's confidence. And Pettis was now able to do what he's naturally confident doing. And I just think that really underlines what to what produces a fighter's style, what gets him or her to fight the way that they do. Yeah, and and it's interesting that you raise the point of coaching there because there are different uh, there are different approaches to this, you know. But the but what is consistent, and almost every coach will tell you this, is that it's about confidence. That Rafael Cordero just harps on this constantly. Um, I had the opportunity to interview him again, and we actually got a lot deeper than we did in the, in the first conversation that we had, um, the first interview that I did with him. And he, talk, he just consistently talks about confidence, that he thinks that is by far the most important thing. Far more important than skills is believing in yourself and believing that you can hurt your opponent, 
and that your opponent can't hurt you. He goes so far as in the corner, he says he never talks about what the opponent is doing. He only talks about what his fighter is doing because he doesn't want his fighter worrying about the opponent. He only wants the, to, them to be focused on their own confidence, on their own sense of self, almost. Yeah. Whereas, you know, the flip side to that, to, to getting somebody to, uh, to fight to type, is Faraz Sahabi, who essentially believes in an almost Puritan-like process of breaking his fighter's will and remolding them into what he wants them to be according to, according to his type. Like, to whatever where, their attributes may be or... Yeah, exactly. That, like, you know, it, he, he talked about that with Rory McDonald. He called Rory a wild cat. He said, when, I, when Rory came to me, he was a wild cat, and I had to break him down. And so that's why so many of Zahabi's guys are, are willing and able to fight everywhere and are just like chameleons that he can mold into whatever they need to be for a given fight. That's a process of totally remolding their temperament as a fighter, you know, Absolutely. so which is no small feat to accomplish because these as, as we've been discussing, these things are largely inbuilt. They're the product of who you are and where you come from and your family and whether you have siblings or not and, you know, childhood experiences to completely break somebody down and change who they are. And Cordero does this too. Cordero wants his guys aggressive. And so you've got to break, uh, you've got to break down these, uh, like all of these normal personality traits and reforge them into something else. It shows how deep a process that really is. And I think it's why we, we have so few trainers who produce a successful, a wide array of successful styles. Because most coaches have a particular way they like fighters to fight. Um, honestly, I'm racking my brain right now to think of fighters who fight in a, in a wide array of styles. Maybe uh, Jack Blackburn, who trained mm -hmm. Sugar Ray Robinson and Joe Lewis and uh, Jersey Joe Walcott. All very mm -hmm. different fighters. Um, all could maybe be brought back to the boxer puncher type, but the fact that they were well rounded belies the fact that they, each of them had a very unique approach to fighting. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe Nacho Beristein, who has trained Finito Lopez and Juan Manuel Marquez and uh, uh, Rafael Marquez and uh, Daniel Zaragoza. Those are mm -hmm. all very different fighters too. Uh, Marquez is an interesting example, by the way. We'll get back to Pettis Esparza in a moment, but. Marquez is a guy who became a counterpuncher over time. Marquez mm -hmm. is a guy whose natural inclination was to brawl. And, of course, you still see that in his fights. He still likes to brawl. He's still a little too easy to get sucked into brawls. It's part of the reason why he looked so unimpressive against Tim Bradley, because mm -hmm. Bradley goaded him into coming forward, uh, where he's, he's really – his skill set does not suit him because his combination punching um, – is, is and his focus really makes him best suited to be a counterpuncher, but his mentality is that of a guy who wants to fight. He wants to fight now. But that's also why Juan Manuel Marquez is the most dangerous guy to hurt in the world of boxing, because the moment you hurt Juan Manuel Marquez, something clicks, years and years of training, and he becomes calm and focused, and he waits for you to come at him to finish him off, and he knocks you the hell out. So... Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, and that's a, an example of a fighter evolving in such a way that it that it actually benefits them as a fighter, and that's not yes. always the case. Absolutely, so where where you get guys who are trying to fight against type. Like, I'll give you a really concrete example of this: uh, UFC middleweight uh, uh, Luke Barnett, who by mm. inclination is either a boxer puncher or a brawler. He's somebody who wants to put a pace on you. He wants to fight in the pocket, uh, or maybe a pressure fighter. And I does it well. Look at, he does it well. Yeah, yeah, he's not like he's not a scrub at doing this, but because he's six foot six, uh, the his current trainer, uh, a guy, a guy training, a guy training him out of San Diego, he trains at Alliance and Victory MMA there, um, has tried to turn him into an outfighter, and it's sucked away all of his offensive output, his work rate, and it's really turned him in. It's taken away his sense of urgency. He really doesn't fight like uh, he really doesn't fight like he's got a fire lit under him anymore, and. It's just a clear example of a guy who's who's being told to do something that just does not fit with who he is as a right. fighter at all. The opposite like the, of what happened with Rory McDonald. He went you know, Barnett went from wildcat to kitten, basically. Exactly. Yeah. It, it's and it just does not work for who he is at all in the slightest. Totally. Okay. Well, we're going to take a quick break, everybody. When we come back, we will talk more about Anthony Pettis, and then I want to move on to Carla Esparza versus Joanna Yendracek. Yendracek. My God, I'm, I'll never get it right, Pat. And uh, we're going to talk about how, how her style, which is a slightly different style of outfighting, but one which is also uniquely suited to MMA and to her skill set and personality after this. Okay, wait, stop. Don't skip this break. I know you skip most of them. It's a podcast. It's not a radio show. You don't have to listen to the commercials. But if you follow my very simple instructions, you'll be doing a huge service to heavy hands, Pat 
and myself. First, go to Stitcher.com or iTunes.com. You can use either of those services to subscribe to the show, which makes it really, really easy to listen to every episode and not have to go hunting for it on our confusing, badly designed website. Once you're there, give us a positive rating and a positive review. That means go to the little five-star thing and click on the star all the way to the right. That's a five-star rating. That's the best one you could possibly give us. And like 20 or 30 words about how you enjoy the show. It may not seem like much, but it's a huge help to us, and we really appreciate it. It helps us bring heavy hands to an ever-increasing audience, which is just good for everybody. So thank you for listening. Please take the time to give us a positive rating and review. Uh, next time that you're on at your computer, at your phone, whatever, iTunes.com, Stitcher.com, search for Heavy Hands, give a positive rating and a review. Thank you. And now, back to the show. And we are back. So, Pat, before we move on to Esparza versus Yen Zhechek, let's give, I guess, our predictions for how Pettis Dos Anjos will play out. What, what's your general thoughts? What are your expectations for this bout? Well, I, I think at this point we can tell that Dos Anjos has slipped very neatly into this mold of pressure fighter, um, that it's not something that he really did much earlier in his career. And I think that uh, working with Rafael Cordero has kind of unlocked this hidden well of aggressiveness within Dos Anjos and channeled it into something tangible. And that tangible thing is a really nice forward-moving pressure game. Um, and we've seen that in Dos Anjos' last few fights. Um, I mean, he was willing to pressure Nick D- or Nate Diaz, who is not generally somebody that you look to pressure. Usually you look to outfight against the Diaz brother. And Dos Anjos was perfectly happy to waltz forward, uh, push, him, uh, push him close to the cage, and just kick the crap out of him. Yeah. Like, literally kick the crap out of him. Um, so I think at this point it's safe to say that Dos Anjos has developed this pressuring game. I think that given what we've seen on tape, and you know Cordero is not a dumb man, he knows how to watch tape as well as the rest of us, that it's clear that that is the way to give yourself the best chance of beating Anthony Pettis is to continuously walk him down. I think that's what we'll see from Dos Anjos. And, I th- and he's good at it. I, th- I would be surprised if he didn't take at least one round on points doing exactly that. Yeah. Now the problem is you know, Pettis is just so dynamic and the kind of mental pressure that he puts on you. This was something Gilbert Melendez mentioned to me when I interviewed him uh, about a month and a half after that fight was just how much mental pressure Anthony puts on you. Uh, Anthony Pettis puts on you in the cage that you can't ever relax, you know, because, you know, he's he's there and he's going to try to finish you. Right. And um, that's that's really interesting. That's kind of the difference between just uh, what makes a pressure fighter. Every fighter has the ability to exert pressure. You know, a, a counter puncher might make you feel like you have to throw and a pressure fighter might make you feel like you have to move. And a boxer, an out fighter like Anthony Pettis might make you feel like you have to watch out for what's coming at every possible moment. Pressure is not the sole realm of the pressure fighter. There's definitely a mental aspect, some some a test of mental fortitude that Pettis puts his opponents through. Absolutely. I mean, I couldn't possibly put that better. And I think that Dos Anjos is going to be prepared to deal with that kind of mental pressure. Um, but I think that just the sheer dynamism of Anthony Pettis and his ability to finish you with, with one or two shots at any given point in the fight, um, to finish you with so many different ways, with so many different tools, um, eventually I think that Dos Anjos is going to walk himself into a high kick or an uppercut, um, some other kind of fight finishing strike in, in maybe the second or the third round. But I would expect Dos Anjos to be winning the fight up to that point. Yeah, I I think I can see that happening too. I, I think second or third round we may see a Pettis stoppage. It's there's I do think it's a distinct chance that we may get to that we may get to a decision. Uh, both guys tough. Anthony Pettis. The thing is, is is he's not necessarily hard to find. There's also this idea that all boxers are great defensive fighters, and Anthony Pettis is not. He's uh you know he's not impossible to hit. He's been hit by Jeremy Stevens. He's been hit by Clay Guida. He's been hit by guys who are not that good bo- of boxers. I mean Stevens is a lot better now, but at the time they fought, he was he was basically a one-handed puncher and he connected pretty pretty consistently with Pettis. Um I mean I think that's a consistent thing about outfighters in general is that they they seem a lot more defensively slick than they actually are because in absolute terms, given the fact that they operate at such a long range relative to their opponents, either all the way out or all the way in, yes. both places where it's hard to produce consistent volume, in absolute terms, they don't get hit very much. Percentage-wise, they may get hit quite a bit because they tend to rely so heavily on angles and distance for defense rather than a second layer 
of parries and head movement. Yeah, that's a great point. I, I think there there's sort of the idea that an, an outfighter appears defensively sound, but it's really because they're always trying to put the other guy in a position where he can't throw. Not because exactly. they can let him throw and then make a miss, but because they don't give him the chance to throw in, in a favorable position to begin with. Um, like look at like Lyoto Machida, a guy who who's probably more of a counter fighter under this scheme, but uh, but in terms of the range that he likes to operate at, uh, very like it, Machida rarely moves his head. Machida Machida may parry a little bit, but really his defense is predicated almost entirely on just not being in the spot that you're throwing at. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think I got to go with Pettis too. I I. I think Dos Anjos has a, a fairly strong chance. I think he's going to try to do what Gilbert Melendez did, and Melendez had no inconsiderable amount of success. I also think that Pettis has more power and uh, uh, somewhat more effective aggression. I think he's a better ring cutter than Gilbert Melendez. I think he's harder to escape, and I think he hits harder, and he's got a wider variety of weapons as well. Uh, we, we said this a few times, but Dos Anjos really is – one of the very few fighters in MMA who kicks like a Thai. He kicks like a, a Muay Thai fighter from Thailand. He has absolutely uh, no care for your well-being when he throws a kick. And if you give him the opportunity to land a kick, he'll just throw it two or three more times until you decide to do something about it. And if you never do, you'll never stop eating the kick. It's just sort of the Thai mentality of attack what's open, and if it continues to be open, keep going and throw really, really hard at it. Um so that that makes him very very dangerous. But again, we talked about that mental pressure of Anthony Pettis, that movement. I think he's going to try to focus a lot on not letting Dos Anjos get the space he needs, uh, not get the the position he needs. Rather, constantly moving, trying to turn him, and and then once he gets those angles, trying to throw with quick combinations or with powerful kicks and trying to take Dos Anjos' head off. So I, I think I also like Anthony Pettis for a, a mid fight or late round TKO. Uh, but I'm really, really looking forward to it. Uh, with that, let's move on to our co-main event matchup. We've got another very, very archetypal outboxer here. Someone in, uh, it's Carla Esparza, and I think she she kind of fits more of a uniquely MMA archetype for what an outfighter is. Pettis is very much what you would expect from a boxer or a kickboxer of that type. He does those things very well. But Esparza, of course, her res- her, her base is wrestling not boxing, not kickboxing. She can do those things well enough, but really her goal is to get that takedown. And the way that Esparza gets her best takedowns are as reactive takedowns, where you'll move in and she'll change levels and run you over. She's very much like a a female strawweight George St. Pierre in that sense. Or as you've pointed out a couple times, Pat, in your uh, Sure Dog preview, for example, like a female strawweight Frankie Edgar. That she does a very good job of hiding her takedowns with her hands, getting you to exchange, and then running through you. And I think there's there's something there about the way that outfighters prefer to counter that uniquely applies itself to MMA. And you can tell me if I'm on to something here. Um, I'm going to take a slight digression. I'm going to talk about a boxer who I think of as being one of not only the most entertaining, but one of the most quintessential outfighters of all time, which is Willie Pep. Uh, If people have seen Willie Pep... They know what he's about. He moves around very gracefully, not necessarily even adopting a stance most times. He'll happily just square his feet and circle, 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 and he'll go into southpaw. He'll go into orthodox. He'll stay square so that he can switch into either one and run you into a punch. He's constantly trying to force you to turn, to play catch up. You're always looking for him, and he's always basically laying traps so that he can, as we said before, keep the initiative, have the advantage, get off first, and then get out. And... uh, a lot of this means that Pep does countering. He, he counters, but I think there's a a specific type of counter that I've noticed looking at Pep, looking at Esparza, looking at lots of different outfighters that outfighters prefer. And I think it's the same time counter that identifies best with the outfighter mentality. Um, you know, well, how would how many different types of counter would you say there are, Pat? I mean, you've got we've talked about half beat counters, we've talked about back step counters. counters, bait counters, yeah. exactly, mm-hmm. pull counters, all sorts of. Yeah, I mean, I think the same time counter is a is is a quintessential outfighter one. I think you're absolutely right. I think you're onto something there, and I'll tell you why I think that is. It's 
because outfighters tend to hold one of two or maybe both maybe both of these advantages over their competition and this is partially what makes them outfighters in the first place is that i think they to be successful at it you either need to be longer or faster than your opponent and if you're throwing at the same time as your opponent and you're longer and faster longer and or faster your shot is going to get there first yeah, I think Does that makes sense to you. I, I think that's a great point, and and I think also we've got this the idea that a same time counter, to my mind, more than any other kind of counter, is a one which is not as much as any counter can be. It's not equal ground. It's yes. not fair to the opponent. If you let the opponent throw first and use your defense to make a miss and then fire back a half beat counter or a slip or a pull or whatever movement you're using and whatever rhythm, that's giving him a chance to hit you before you get to hit him. And when you counter back, he may hit you with his second punch, even if the first one misses, if he decides to throw a combination. With the same time counter, the the kind that outfighters use, we have the fighter throwing their strike as the opponent throws, where they've basically already planned a route of escape. They've already given the opponent the opportunity to throw only one kind of punch, and they're basically hitting, and while they're hitting, they're moving away already, so that they can't be hit by anything else. It's the ultimate outfighter's counter. So... In Willie Pep's case, it's this sort of – he does it really well out of southpaw where he'll circle to his left, circle, circle, the way that orthodox fighters normally normally go. And then when his opponent steps in hard to chase him, he'll suddenly stop, switch directions, step past them to the right, and bring a left southpaw cross with him. Hit them as they step forward and then suddenly be off basically behind them so that they have no opportunity to follow up. And in Esparza's case, the same as another outfighter like George St. Pierre, Frankie Edgar does this as well. All of these are outfighters in MMA. She does this with takedowns. She does the same time counter takedown as her preferred method because it's the safest way she knows it's the most the, the the most confidence she can have in a takedown is one in which the opponent is off balancing themselves they're basically being compelled to throw so she she can then run them off their feet yeah and and think about think about that too in terms of the range at which you're operating when you hit a reactive takedown your reactive takedown is from the what is essentially the pocket right so in lieu of exchanging which is the other thing that you might do at that range, you duck under and you hit your double leg. Yes. So A, so it makes sense both timing-wise in terms of having the high, in terms of always wanting to have the high, essentially the high ground. Yes. Uh, and it also, it, it makes sense on all, it, it makes sense on all of these levels, on timing, range, and uh, timing, range, and preference. Absolutely. I just want to see if I'm onto something there. It's a thing that's yeah. been kind of brewing in my mind for a while, and it seems to, it seems to check out. Uh, yeah, I, th- I, I think you're absolutely correct with that. I think you're absolutely onto something. Now, how about uh, how about Joanna uh, Yenjechek? She's what I would describe, you know, another archetypal fighter on this card. She's a boxer puncher. She's kind of a jack of all trades. She basically has the skills of a boxer. She can do what a boxer does. And what sets her part apart from a fighter like Asparza is that she also has tons and tons of confidence in basically yes. any situation. And I think that is what really defines the boxer puncher the reason they can do everything is because they don't feel that they're at a disadvantage anywhere the boxer Mm -hmm. the outfighter has a very clear idea of where their disadvantages are most styles do but the boxer puncher doesn't feel like they have any whether they're right or not the confidence comes through and i think that's what we see in in jacek's approach she's she's probably at her very best when she's pressuring and moving forward but she's happy to counter if she has to and she does it well and she's happy to move and box if she has to and she does that well as well she she does all of the aspects of the other styles well enough to get by and to make her a very difficult person to adapt for so what does esparza do against a fighter with that kind of adaptability well, I think Esparza's answer is going to be constant circular movement. I think that this is going to look, uh, this fight is going to look a lot like uh, Frankie Edgar versus BJ Penn, the first two installments, where you have the the smaller, fleeter of foot fighter uh, utilizing a lot of circular movement, a lot of angles, uh, trying to hit, uh, trying to hit takedowns when the uh, when the uh, when the boxer puncher, as as BJ Penn essentially was for for large chunks of his career, um, when they set their feet to throw. That's when we're going to see. Uh, that's when we're going to see the uh, Asparza uh, shooting shooting her takedowns. Now, I expect uh, I expect uh, Yin Jacek to stuff most of those in the first few rounds because she is an outstanding defensive wrestler. Um, Asparza is going to have to have a really clear sense of where she is. It's going to be hard for her to get in on Yin Jacek's hips because she's so tall and because her her limbs are so long. It's going to be hard to get in there without getting stuffed. 
I expect Esparza to make the adjustment of faking uh, faking the level change, faking the shot, and coming up high with a with a punching combination. Yes, and, and I, that's something she does very well is is mix those transitions. I, I can't really say what style that, uh, of our archetypes that 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 matches with best, but just in terms of technique, she's very very good at, at mixing up the takedowns and the punches. And just like Frankie Edgar, she will happily use takedowns that aren't working just to get the takedown in your mind. Uh, again, Jacek does this too with her punches. She'll happily wing wild overhand rights if it gets you thinking about that and then come through with the uppercut or the left hook to the body, something that capitalizes on the way you react to that. But Esparza does this in a way that really might give her the advantage against Yan Jacek, who I think everybody agrees is it wants to fight on her feet. She doesn't want to grapple with Carla Esparza. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I don't think that there's anybody in the division, aside from maybe Jessica Penne, who would want to grapple with Carla Esparza, because Espar- Esparza from top position, much like the, the newer school version of Frankie Edgar that we've seen, um, is just a monster from top position. I mean, she drops, she passes really nicely. She drops, she drops just a steady stream of ground and pound with, with real power in it. Um, and she can, and she can hit nice little submissions and, and positional advancements in, in scrambles because she's so small and so athletic. She moves really well in those transitional spaces. Um, and she's, she's also happy to rinse and repeat with takedowns, which I think is a, a new thing that we're starting to see more in MMA. Um, when you have deeper wells of cardio to, to work with and you have smaller and you know, smaller fighters, um, we'll see more people who are willing to just take you down and then let, let you get back up if it means that they get to land a knee in three punches when you do so. Yeah, um, I think that's so, really the hallmark of Frank Edgar's style. His greatest, I mean, against Gray Maynard, that was what won in the fight. Shooting the takedowns, hitting the punches, and then just resetting. Like the most annoying person you'd meet at a jiu-jitsu tournament, just taking you down, letting you stand up. Taking you down, letting you stand up. Exactly, exactly. And I, and I think that that's, um, my, it, you know, if we're making predictions, my prediction for this fight is Esparza to retain her title by, by five-round decision. And I think that's in large part because her game layers so well given more time to work that unless Yin Jacek gets her out of there in the first two rounds, which is entirely possible, Yin Jacek has big power in her hands and she fights mean. You know, if she gets Esparza hurt, I don't think Esparza is escaping. Um, so unless she gets her out of there early, though, you can expect all of these different aspects of Esparza's game to layer together and become more effective as the fight goes on, just as Frankie Edgar did against BJ Penn, both t- both times they fought. Frankie got better as those fights wore on because when you're expecting a takedown, then instead of a takedown, you eat three punches to the face. You expect three punches to the face, and what you get instead is a takedown. Um, so I think that that's essentially what I'm expecting here is probably a four round to one decision for for Esparza. And and in Esparza's case, we've we've also got uh, we've got someone who will be doing something against type. Uh, mm. She's she's also she's also not afraid to whether or not she she feels most comfortable doing it, she's not afraid to fight in a way that is not necessarily natural to her style in order to gain a momentary advantage or send a message to her opponent. Uh, we saw this a lot in her fight with Rose Namajunas, where, for example, in the first round, she got Namajunas down on a double leg. Namajunas escaped. She got to half guard, did a nice technical stand-up with a, uh, with a whizzer. And then as she stood, Esparza just ran through her with punches. And it wasn't pretty. And she didn't have good footwork, and she got herself out of position, and she got hit for doing it. But she sent the very important message to Rose that you can't just run through me and expect to get away from my takedowns without without being punished. You know, I'm yeah. not a fun person to fight. You can't you can't have fun, which is really what Nama Yunus was trying to do in the opening phases of that fight. She said, you have to take me seriously, and by the way, you're not good enough to do it. So now the interesting thing is, She's got an opponent, Yan Jacek, who also does that. Uh, the difference being that Yan Jacek does it naturally. She likes to – I would. I've described her uh, a couple times uh, having done – work done two articles on her now. By the time this comes out, this episode will have come out on Bloody Elbow just before the second part of my article on uh, Yan Jacek, basically kind of describing her as cruel – which isn't meant to disparage her, but just to kind of highlight what makes her such a dangerous fighter, which is that she seems to enjoy not only hurting her opponents, but making them feel weak and mm-hmm. unconfident, making them throw and miss only to hit them back and, and make them feel stupid almost for, for daring to throw at her. It's, it's, she's kind of like, like, like a big brother or big sister picking on a little sibling when she fights. And so, mm-hmm. 
with Esparza, we've got somebody who will be doing that to some degree. Like the fake takedown to punch exchange you mentioned probably isn't something that Esparza would most prefer to do, but it's something she will choose to do strategically. The difference is that and Jacek likes to do stuff like that. She likes to use one thing to set up the other thing. She likes to stand in the pocket and exchange. So is there a chance that we see the veneer slip or or what what could Yin Jacek do to maybe expose the difference between their two skill sets? Or does it really just come down to the skills of the two fighters, the fact that Esparza is just a better wrestler than Yin Jacek when it really comes down to it? Well, so my thought is if this fight happened in a year, and Yen Jacek had maybe two or three more fights and, and, you know, another couple of camps to really work on things. I think this would be an entirely different fight. And I think I would probably favor Yen Jacek at that point. But a lot of what you're talking about and the question that you're asking comes down to experience. And Yen Jacek has only been an MMA fighter for two and a half years. You know, it's only been two and a half years since her professional debut, which is astounding, That's, by the way, especially considering how good of a wrestler she is in that time. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, she's made astounding progress, but there are only a few, but there are some things in MMA and transitions to a, to a large extent are one of them that you can only learn with enough time. Um, and so I think to, to some extent, yeah, it comes down to skills. If Yen Jacek were more willing to kick. I think I would give her a better. I think I would give her a better chance from a strategic perspective because what she's got to do is she's got to force the the faster, smaller fighter who prefers circular movement to stand in front of her. Right? Would you Would you agree with that? Connor? Oh, absolutely. And that's exactly what Dos Anjos is going to be doing to Pettis. In this case, however, again, Jacek is going to be probably at her best trying to pressure like Dos Anjos, but it's pretty clear at this point she doesn't feel comfortable kicking an MMA the way she used to in her Muay Thai bouts. Yeah, and whether that's a whether that's she's just way more comfortable with her hands, or whether she's worried about takedowns. I think it's the that, takedowns. Yeah, I, and I think, honest to God, I think that's a serious overreaction from from striking trainers who are trying to get uh, kickboxers ready for ready for MMA. Like they're just they're like, well, you you need to cut back on the kicks, and no, you need to set up your kicks better. It's not that you can't kick. It's not that you need to be just just stone worried about ending up on your back all the time. Trust your single leg defense. Uh, set up your set up your kicks with punches and and throw them. Don't yeah. worry about it. You know, I think that's I think it's uh, over over complicating the problem. Sure, maybe don't throw them like Rose Nama Yunus did and get put on your butt every time you try. But well, uh, yeah, I mean that's it, Boz Rutten is wrong about many things, but one of the things he's not wrong about in MMA is just don't throw naked kicks. Yeah, like, absolutely. Without you, there's so many fighters in MMA. And this is a huge pet peeve of mine who will throw kicks inside their opponent's countering distance without either stepping offline or moving their head offline or using any sort of setup at all. So they just stand there with their heads straight up in the air, their chin up, and throw a kick inside their opponent's counter range. Like, like Dustin Poirier is just the worst at this, yeah. you know? Like, where <laughs> yeah. no setup, no, no pulling your head offline, Ernesto Hoost style, nothing. And, and that's exactly what Rose Namajunas did against Carlos Esparza. So it wasn't like a mystery when Esparza grabbed a couple of kicks and worked <laughs> takedowns. It's like, what did you expect to happen? <laughs> you can't just walk in, stand at punching distance, and head kick her. It doesn't work like that. Yeah, it's just, I mean, Pet Pet Anthony Pettis did that against Benson Henderson in their, in their first fight, and he gets back to the corner. Rufus just looks at him and says, no more of that, huh? No more of that. <laughs> and, and Pettis looks very sheepish, and then he didn't do it again the rest of the fight. But, you know, if, I think if Yen Jacek were a little more willing to kick, if she had more tools of that, of that variety, I would be more inclined to think that she has a good chance here. Um, but without having seen that from her before, I think it's hard to predict that that's a thing that she's going mm -hmm. to do or mm -hmm. going to be able to do. You know what I mean? Yeah, this is, one, this is a fight that I keep waffling on. Obviously, I'm a big fan of Yen Jacek. I really love what she does. She's only 26, by the way, despite her relatively long experience in combat sports. She's young to MMA and young in general so it's possible she's got quite a long career ahead of her even for such a, a small fighter whose careers tend to be shorter uh, but I, I agree with you I, I, I tend to... see the thing is is Yen Jacek as an underdog sounds like a great bet and Carla Esparza as only a slight favorite also sounds like a great bet. So it's mm -hmm. a very difficult one to call. I think I have to go with Carla Esparza. She hasn't gotten the love she deserves, but she is really a fantastic fighter. And as we said, an archetypal outfighter. She's not in, not just in the sense that she needs to have the advantage to win, but in that she's good at making sure she has the advantage. She's good at setting up her fight so that it plays to her strengths. And she's just a different level of fighter from any that uh, Ian Jacek has faced before with the exception, perhaps, of Claudia Gadelia, who Yen Jacek did struggle with a lot. So uh, 
you know, we've, and we've got an interesting matchup on our hands, two interesting matchups. Uh, I think we're going to take one more break. And when we come back, we will get into examples of outfighting from other combat sports, namely kickboxing and boxing, and, and talk a little bit more about what makes this style unique, what sets it apart from the others. And uh, we will do that after this break. Okay, so here's another way you can help us out. Go to your couch, lift up the cushions, and scrounge around in the creases for uh, change, lint, uh, like bent paper clips, like a thumbtack that you stab your thumb on and then you scream alone in your living room. Throw all the stuff out except the change. All right, now take that and deposit it into your bank account or your PayPal account. Head over to heavyhandspodcast.com and click on the Donate button on the right side of your screen. Whatever money you just found, which you weren't using anyway, send it to us, all right? Because Pat and I will use it. That money helps us keep this show on the air and free of charge, which is great for you. It's great for us because that way we're making a little bit of money. The donations are a huge deal for us. So please go to heavyhandspodcast.com. Any spare change that you might have lying around, hit the donate button on the right side of the screen and send it our way to help us keep this show live. Thanks. And now back to Heavy Hands. And we are back. Just a couple more minutes here left on the show for you guys. We want to try and look at some other combat sports where uh, obviously we derived our styles from boxing. You know, boxing has a long history of analysts watching the sport and basically de- deriving categories from what they see, trying to to identify what the fighters are doing in a specific way so so as to better to to be better able to predict what the fighter will do in the future and to understand why it is that they're doing what they do. So we have the boxers, the boxer punchers, counterfighters, the pressure fighters. Obviously, these are all things that exist in boxing. Um, so to, to bring it back to, to the roots of the style system, let's talk about boxers, the boxers that sort of set this archetype in stone that gave us the idea of what makes an outfighter, a boxer, an outboxer, that kind of fighter. Who, who would you say is the quintessential boxer of that style? We already mentioned Willie Pep earlier, but Pat, you have somebody else in mind? Well, so I, I think that we have we have a few we have a few examples that we can talk about here. But if we're talking about the person, not that this is somebody that we raised in our many discussions about this, uh, but James J. Corbett is the type specimen of the boxer. Yes. Would you? Would you? So James J. Corbett, uh, heavyweight champion of the late nineteen uh, of the late nineteenth century, and somebody who had a long afterlife in boxing as well as a, as a trainer and as a kind of a, a public intellectual on the topic of boxing. Um, so Corbett was the very first outfighter, as we would understand it, who got wide play in the media. Would, would you say that's fair to say, Connor? Yeah, and it's interesting because uh, we, we, it, it, we, when we look back in boxing history, um, we see that the, the fighters who are most, uh, most renowned for being technicians – are almost always outfighters. They're the ones who were considered the scientific pioneers of their day. And so the first one to do this was, uh, was I would go back and say Daniel Mendoza. Mm, who yeah, that's true. Was um, an early, an early boxer. I think he was probably fighting near the end of the 18th century. His style doesn't look anything like modern prize fighting as near as we can tell based in the pictures of his stance, but he was one of the first guys to be smaller than what were at the time generally large, brutish brawlers and and use his speed and his small frame to his advantage and also showed the limitations of that when uh, he fought... Um, oh gosh, I wish I could remember which uh, which fight it was that he got absolutely battered in. He 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 took a fight and and basically got grabbed by his hair and got pummeled into into bits. So that's something that happened in old school boxing, and it, it's also something that um, that sort of <laughs> lays out the disadvantages of being smaller and fleet fleet footed as your specialty. Then of yeah, course we have Jim Corbett, also like one of the guys best known as just being a brilliant scientific boxer, a guy who did the craft better than anyone else, and then. The more modern example of this is Muhammad Ali, and we talk about Muhammad Ali in the same way. We have this sort of inbuilt thing, this inbuilt idea that the outfighter is the boxer. It's why the type is also called the boxer type. It's, it's the quintessential boxer. It's what boxing is meant to be. Whether or not that's true, it's it. We, we really celebrate the idea of being able to dance around a guy and make him look silly while you pot shut him to pieces. And nobody... And nobody... I think in boxing history has ever embodied the the swagger 
of the outfighter better than Muhammad Ali. Yes. This idea that I can hit you and you can't hit me that, that lies at the core of the type. Nobody has embraced that and, and shrubbed it in their opponent's face quite to the extent that Muhammad Ali did. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but Ali is really interesting because he does what we think is, I would say, the quintessential outfighter thing, which is circular movement while using your longest range strike, right? Use, whether, whether that's uh, in, in boxing, that's the jab, right? So the idea of circling and jabbing as the quintessential outfighter thing to do, Muhammad Ali did that better than just about anybody with those incredibly tight turns. His ability to, his understanding of space, where he was in the ring and where he was relative to his opponent, and the, the switching up the directionality of the movement while almost always circular. Um, you know, uh, Muhammad Ali really, really embodied that in uh, in very deep way, in a very deep way, down to his core. But yeah. Ali also did something that. I think we, we don't talk about enough with the outfighter, which is picking his spots to throw power punches and combinations. So I, I think the, the, the early example of this, uh, early in Muhammad Ali's career, is when he fought Archie Moore, right? So he circled and jabbed, circled and jabbed, circled and jabbed, and then he would pick his spots. And we see this across the type, across different combat sports. The, the very greatest outfighters have a gift for be, by continually showing you that range with the jab and by continuously moving, of tricking you into thinking you're in range to exchange when really you're not, when really they're in range to throw three or four hard punches or head kicks or what have you, um, when and making you think that you're that you're uh, you're in your range and really you're not. So you end up eating these hard shots. Another guy who's really good at that semi shilt, uh, outstanding at it. Tyson Fury, uh, fantastic at doing yes. that. Other right. boxers, um, we have Lionel Rose. If anybody hasn't seen him, I mentioned him a couple times on the show before. One of my favorite guys to watch. Broke down fighting Harada, legendary pressure fighter, just with ease. And a lot of that was, you know, and it's not just sending messages uh, with the, the exchanging and stuff like that, but but knowing when to sit down on what is the quintessential boxer combination, just a good old one-two. And even a one-two-one, one, just keep those straight punches in their face, let them run into them, and they stay at the end of the punches while eating the full force of every single one of them. And uh, Hilario Zapata is another fighter of this style. Willie Pep, Willie Pastrano, all of these guys were capable punchers. Uh, Willie Pep was, in fact, quite the knockout artist before he, he ended up in a plane crash that kind of destroyed part of the way he fought, where he was told he would never walk again and still remarkably came back to become champion. So... But, but but Pep was was a decent puncher, and it, it's important to to understand that punching is not an antithesis to the idea of being an outfighter. Uh, Willie Pep was a decent enough puncher in his time. Vladimir Klitschko, who is the heavyweight champion today, is probably one of the hardest punchers in the history of boxing. He puts yes. people away with single punches, and he makes it look easy. He doesn't even have to grit his teeth and throw. He just it's like being shot by a sniper rifle uh, from only 100 feet away. It just takes you off your feet and you're gone. And yet, despite this, Vladimir Klitschko is not a boxer puncher. He does not like exchanges. He does not like to be on equal ground. He likes to be on high ground. He likes to have the advantage. He likes to keep you either on the end of his reach or he likes to do what he did to Alexander Povetkin and just basically let you come into range and instead of exchanging with you or continuing to back up, once you're close enough, he will just drape himself over you and lay on top of you. Yeah, I mean it's it's very similar to to what imagines uh, to what one imagines uh, Vladimir Klitschko looks like with his absolutely comically tiny uh, <laughs> fiance Hayden Panettiere. <laughs> I mean it's uh, it's it's essentially the same. It's essentially the same thing. That's how Klitschko looks, just draped over a much smaller fighter on the inside. I mean, but Klitschko does this to an almost <laughs> embarrassing extent. I mean, the Povetkin fight, uh, Connor. I think you're you're right. Is the worst example, but against Kubra Pulev too. Uh, in, in one of Klitschko's more recent outings. I mean, it was just it, like any time uh, Pulev came anywhere close to being in, ex to being in range to exchange, uh, Klitschko was just all over him, draped all over him. But this illustrates <clears throat> one of the principles that we've talked about consistently with regard to outfighters, which is either all the way out or all the way in. And unless you absolutely have to, i.e. when you're backed up to the ropes or, the, or, or to the fence, you're not going to exchange with them, right? I'm astounded at how seamlessly you moved into that Hayden Panettiere joke and then away from it. 
<laughs> no comment from you. No digression. It was it was as if it was part of the stylistic analysis. In a way, it is because if your personality determines who you are as a fighter, surely who you are in the ring is the same person you will be in the bedroom. <laughs> That's not, you can't hide from your fighting style, and neither can your wife or fiance, whatever she is. Yeah, so I mean, maybe, maybe really, what this podcast is calling out for, Connor, is an interview with a with Hollywood starlet Hayden Panettiere. <laughs> maybe, maybe that's really what we need to push this whole shebang to the next level. Hayden Panettiere, wife, fiance, and or homunculus of heavyweight champion Vladimir Klitschko. <laughs> 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 oh sweet christ i think that's the right uh, note on which to end the show pat i don't think it gets better than that i don't think we could either that is fantastic <laughs> uh coming out this week of course you have the ufc 185 preview on sherdog.com pat does this before every ufc event and they're always worth reading especially if you like me have a preview video of your own to do and don't have time to research the entire card just read pat's thing uh, it's a great resource. Anything else you have coming out this week or before uh, our next episode? Yeah, I've got a top 10 uh, feature article coming out on Sherdog uh, about the uh, the 10 greatest five-round fights of all time, fights that were scheduled for five rounds. Sounds great. Um, and then, uh, yeah, no, that's about all I got this week. I mean, Connor, you did uh, you did a fantastic first part of a preview article on uh, you, the striking of Ioana Janjacek. Uh, so you've got part two of that coming out. What else do you have this week? I got part one, part two, Ioana Janjacek, my, my, my new secret crush, both stylistically, technically, and... Uh... Well, I won't go any further than that. And then I uh, <laughs> should also have a couple pieces coming out the end of this week. One, hopefully, well, there's two options here. I'll either have one piece on Rafael Dos Anjos and a gaps in the armor piece on lightweight champion Anthony Pettis. Or if that goes on a little longer than I intend, I will do two part gaps in the armor piece on basically how Javier Dos Anjos, uh, what his best shot would be at dethroning the champion, how he has to fight in order to take that belt away from him. And then, of course, we've got a big boxing event coming out this weekend. Another quintessential boxer puncher in uh, Sergei Kovalev is fighting Jean Pascal this Saturday, and uh, I will be covering that fight live on BadLeftHook.com and on the Bad Left Hook Twitter, and I will be doing a Sergei Kovalev breakdown for uh, before the end of this week as well. So another busy week for me, Pat. Wow. So uh, Sergei Kovalev story for you. Uh, I once drove to Malibu behind Sergei Kovalev. Uh, I noticed the logo, which he has displayed prominently on the back of his BMW, and I thought... That looks like Sergey Kovalev. We pulled up alongside, and lo and behold, it was Sergey Kovalev. Did you run screaming? Uh, I did not, <laughs> uh, though I was worried about being crushed. Your brain. Oh. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, we should have ended the episode back when I suggested it before. That is that is an excellent point on that note. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody, for joining us. You can find us on social media if you want to ask us questions. Normally, uh, if this is your first time listening, we do a listener question segment at the start of each episode called The Heavy Bag. And if you want to send us questions on Twitter, the best way to do that is to tag them with the hashtag Heavy Bag Questions. That way we can look through them by the time we record the next episode and see all the questions we received in the week before and pick whichever one we like best. Uh, so hashtag Heavy Bag Questions. You can tweet that to either Pat at Patrick underscore Wyman or to me at Boxing Bush B-U-S-C-H. You can also send longer questions episodes suggestions or other requests to my email connor at heavyhandspodcast.com that domain heavyhandspodcast.com is where you can find this and all of our other episodes and of course all of our future episodes will be available on bloodyelbow.com thanks once again for nate for uh, agreeing to make this our new platform we're very excited for this new era in the podcast very excited to be getting paid for doing this finally and uh it's uh it's gonna be a good year pat i know we're in march already um, it was a good year already, but it's, it's, it's looking up. It's, it's fixing to get even better. It's fixing to get good. So uh, thanks for joining us, everybody. If you came here today for the finer points of face punching, you came to the right place. This has been Heavy Hands. <laughs>